the East River of New York City, new headquarters for a new world, on its way up. And there we were, students from all over this world, watching it grow. We were thinking the same thing. What was being built here? Just steel and stone joined by workmen to stand strong? Or an idea, built by two billion people from 59 lands? The idea that they could have peace and freedom if they willed it together. The idea of United Nations. We wondered, and then, we decided to find out for ourselves. We went out to Lake Success. None of us was sure just how you got to talk to the United Nations, but we reminded ourselves that we were members of the greatest association of peoples in history, and then we knew we'd get our questions answered. Who will tell us about the United Nations, we asked. Well, I'll arrange for you to see the Assistant Secretary General in charge of the Department of Public Information. We heard her phone Mr. Benjamin Cohen, and soon we, we told him who we were, why we'd come. And we asked, just what does the United Nations do, Mr. Cohen? That's a very large order, my friend, because the United Nations does so many things. You see, the United Nations inherited many problems, some ancient, some recent, but all of them of far-reaching importance. The story of this work of the United Nations is not found frequently among the headlines, nor in the radio commentaries, but is buried in the back pages of the papers, and uh, mostly forgotten. So, let me tell you a part of that story. It begins with hunger. How empty is peace when there is nothing to eat? The Economic and Social Council, the International Children's Emergency Fund, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations fight hunger. Food and Agriculture Organization experts in the field know that peace can be won with better forestry and agriculture. That the earth may produce and the food go where it is needed to reap the harvest in children. There is less hunger now, but the job is not done until there is none. How much can peace mean when disease lives in the world? The World Health Organization is at work in many lands, caring for the sick, seeking them out, fighting tuberculosis with BCG, and every modern method. Fighting an old foe, malaria, with a new weapon, DDT. How many children will grow better because there is a United Nations? But to how many others must the United Nations remain a hope instead of a helping hand? Illiteracy and old sickness has no room in a new United World. UNESCO answers this social disease, this hunger to learn. And the results are good to see. Thousands of we, the people of the United Nations, are learning to read and write learning the promises of life and its problems, learning to add the past to the present. The arithmetic of peace. Thousands have learned and thousands wait eagerly to be taught. The old lessons hurt, such as man's inhumanity to man. Remember, those camps were people concentrated on indignity. Some of us may have forgotten, but the United Nations remembers. It has passed a convention on genocide and a declaration of human rights that under law, the dignity of every man shall be the business of all men. You might remind your governments to ratify the convention on genocide. The world's legacy of wreckage is counted not only in men, but in man-made goods. Assigned to rebuild are the economic commissions and the specialized agencies of the United Nations. They are helping to bring ruined countries back to life, ruined populations to their feet. The sword into the plowshare. Once we used the sword together, now we must use the tools of peace together. Dead trains are buried, left the live ones wrong. 
And under the United Nations, let no wall separate men from exchanging goods and goodwill. From deep in history comes the search of men for a way to settle arguments with justice, not strength. In Palestine, they argued with bullets. The shooting was heard by the United Nations, and it silenced the guns, then mediated under Bernard Dotti and Bunch. You and they know the results. The peoples of Palestine have been made free. A new state has joined the family of nations united. I have just told you about some of the major problems of the world today. Our problems. Your problems are the problems of the United Nations. And I have also explained to you what are the efforts which the United Nations is making in order to solve those urgent problems. This was a very impressive story. But why, we asked, is there not more of this fine work? And why is there not less political disagreement among the nations? Well, my friends, those are excellent questions, and they're all bound together. The reason why the United Nations cannot uh, do more to solve the present problems of the world is precisely because there is so much political disagreement among the big powers on matters outside the jurisdiction of the United Nations. We asked if we could possibly see some of the representatives of the member nations. Well, why not? Let's try to arrange it. As we entered the delegates' lounge, we found General McNaughton, permanent representative of Canada to the United Nations, at work on some papers. General, we asked, what are the chances for greater cooperation among the big powers? I think it is very valuable that you have come to Lake Success from all the corners of the world, and that you have given your best attention to inquiring into what is happening here. You will have seen that the road we have to travel is rough and difficult, and that there are obstacles in plenty. It is well that you should know this, because it is only when the peoples of the world, each and every one of them, fully understand what blocks progress, and when they will bring their thoughts and their wills to bear, that we can expect these difficulties to disappear and the obstacles to be surmounted. I assert that we can look forward with reasoned confidence to this eventual achievement. I am convinced that this will be so because there is no obstruction to progress in the United Nations which is not capable of solution in the light of a properly informed world public opinion. During a recess between meetings, we met Dr. Vladimir Hodek, permanent representative of Czechoslovakia to the United Nations. We asked him the same question. What are the chances for greater cooperation among the big powers? Well, as you know, Czechoslovakia is not a big power. There is, however, something I would like to stress on this occasion. The United Nations emerged as an organization from the victorious war against fascism. The ideas which united the nations in their struggle against the common enemy laid the very foundations of this organization of the United Nations. The World War II could not have been won if the nations had not found a basis for a very close cooperation. If peace is to be preserved, the close cooperation among the big powers inside as well as outside the United Nations is unconditionally necessary. The Forum of the United Nations offers, in my opinion, a very good opportunity for maintaining this cooperation in the interest of peace. We went back for another look at the work on tomorrow's house, and we saw it with different eyes. These workmen were building a home intended for us, intended to house our wish for a free and decent tomorrow, and our determination to get it. And while these men worked, the workers at Lake Success were building the spirit and reality of that kind of tomorrow. But we had a job too, to work with them today, that out of this mud might rise the house, that out of yesterday's destruction might rise tomorrow's peace. 
How could 2,000 million people fail if they all worked and if they all remembered that tomorrow begins today?